Rev Tom here. It is it is Friday night. Friday night. The first Friday of February. Can you believe it's February? Gosh almighty. What the heck happened to the month of January? It is insane. And uh, so now we're February. And it's the shortest month of the year. And so that's going to go by quickly too. Next thing you know, it'll be March. It'll be spring. And uh, time just keeps marching on. But that's okay. Friday night, you know, first Friday of the month. Uh, Got to get situated here. First Friday of the month, it is first stone first stone and i am here to uh share a message with you like i always do at the first of the month and uh, just a shout out to my guys at restoration house miss you guys they have a covid thing so i haven't been able to see them um so that's uh been a little tough you know i miss miss seeing those guys but um Hopefully a week or so from now, uh, it's been two weeks, so hopefully a week from so or now we'll be back at you, and by my Tuesday nights we'll be live with you guys. But in the meantime, let's talk tonight about, I, I, what did I name this thing? I, said, I think it was uh, uh, getting clo- too close to the fire, I think I called it. And uh, it, it struck me today, I, I actually didn't have a, a message that I was going to do until I went to a 2 o'clock meeting, and that sometimes happens, you know, it's, it's, it's time to preach, and I go to a meeting, and it comes to my head. But it came to my head kind of when I was driving with my wife today. Um, my wife and I are like 180 degrees different in how we think about pretty much everything. We always joke that if we get out of the car together, we're either going to go opposite ways or bump into each other. Because we just are, I mean, after almost, what, we've been together 33 years, been married for uh, 29 years this month. Um, yeah, we're, we, we just had, are not aligned in our thinking. And so to, I, I blew out my knee Thursday night, last night, uh, doing some karate. And so I was wearing a big old brace, and I, I couldn't really safely drive. And so I asked my wife to drive to this 2 o'clock meeting we had to go to, which she did, but she took she took my rig. And uh, um, I, I tend to be, uh, you know, I'm a pretty vocal driver when I'm driving by myself, more or less, when I'm having someone else drive. And which drives her crazy, just drives her crazy. And so there I was in the passenger seat, look out for this guy, look out for that guy, right? All this stuff. And where we're different is um, if, if I'm going to have to make a turn, I get in the turn lane about a mile away from the turn so that I'm there, I'm not inconveniencing anybody, you know, I, I can do it on my leisure. Uh, even if I means I'm going slower, I, I do that. Um, I'm a super, super, super defensive driver because I just don't trust any of those people on the road. I just don't, especially these young people nowadays. I sound like I sound like my like my old man or something when I was a kid, but it's true. All these young people are idiots. Um, they drive like maniacs, and so I just drive very defensively. My wife is uh, a, an eternal optimist, and she just believes that if she stays in the lane she wants to be in, eventually they'll let her in when she turns her blinker on uh, to get in the other lane. Now those people drive me crazy because you know they're not they're not being considerate. They're just trying to sneak in ahead of us all. But that's not her thinking. She just drives, and, and so we're driving down the road, and it's like oh yeah 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 yeah, drive me crazy. And so we get to our destination, and we have a meeting with somebody. And it strikes me because the, the person we're meeting with was talking about a situation where um, they probably uh, took an action that was going to be self-triggering. And what I mean by that is they did something that they knew if they did it and it came to fruition was going to trigger them badly. And, of course, it did. And so w- when we look at that, I was like, oh, oh this, this is like driving. This is, this, is like, this is like what we're talking about. Um, do, do you do you get as close as you can to the flame without jumping in the flame because you never really think it's going to happen to you, like my wife, driving down the road thinking that, you know, she's always going to be able to get in that other lane. There's never going to be traffic. There's never going to be some jerk that doesn't let her in with her blinker on, all that stuff. She's just, you know, is it, do you get as close as you can? Or are you like me uh, and you do your best to stay away from the flame as far back as you can because you're risk averse and you get in that lane early and you stay in your lane? And what does this have to do with, with the Lord? Everything. I mean, it's, it's, I'm talking about sin. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about, about driving down the road. I'm talking about uh, do you get as close as you can to sin because you think you're, it's not going to happen to you, the problem's not going to happen to you, or are you somebody who's super, super risk-averse and tries to avoid it? Now, um, I got, I got lots of stories. You know, it's funny tonight. I, I don't have like a prepared uh, outline of what I'm going to talk about, so I'm just going to ramble. But I've got some things happen in the past couple of weeks that really have been playing in my mind regarding this topic. 
and it really does has, have to do with taking risks in my mind. Um, you know, let's let's define some terms. So so sin, you know, that's a term nobody likes. The, the church doesn't even like to use it anymore. And when you do, you're like, oh, you're an old old fuzzy dude, fuddy duddy. No, you know, sin is this idea of rebellion against God, and all that really is is you're selfish. You think what you want is more important than what God wants. You think you're right and God is wrong. Okay, I mean that's what sin is. So God has laid out in the Bible. This is the rules. This this is this is what righteousness looks like. This is what holiness looks like. This is what I want from you. This is what is best for you. Okay, but puts it all in there, and we say. <laughs> And we have this fallen sin nature, and we're going to do what we want to do, and, and we get a foul of God and the, his ways. And uh, then God tells us in the book, hey, you're going to reap what you sow. You're going to reap what you sow. And what's happened in the past, I would say uh, since, I would say since mid, mid-early December, I have watched people kind of implode by making really bad decisions, um, getting way too close to the flame, believing that it's not going to happen to me. You know, not, it can't happen to me. I'll, g- I'll give you an example. One of my uh, uh, guys I was mentoring at, at Restoration House, he was on parole for something, and uh, um, he and a couple of his buddies like to drive up to Columbia County. I guess there's a park up there, and they like to go out there and camp and those kind of things. Well, in my mind, and maybe I'm just way too risk-averse, but if, if I'm uh, in a situation where my freedom is at risk, I'm not going to take any chances about driving up and down the road and, and doing anything. I'm going to stay close to home. I'm going to you know, do my parole time. I'm going to keep my head down, do my job. Um, and not not take any risks. I'm not going anywhere, uh, just because I gotta I gotta mark out my time. And this kid was he's 23, and he was doing great. I mean, he had a job, and he was in school, and he was getting good grades, and every, everything was working out for him. Um, he's a smart kid. He was in uh, what was it? I think a mechanical engineering or something like this, or drafting or some kind of thing. And unfortunately, when he went to Columbia County, he ended up in an accident and uh, his passenger was thrown from the vehicle and unfortunately died. And he's being charged with, the, uh, with manslaughter. And like that, his life changed. He, the next day, or actually I think it was maybe a day or two later, ends up back in town here in Marion County, uh, has to go see his parole officer. They arrest him for a parole violation and now he's in Columbia County awaiting uh, uh, pre-hearing uh, uh, I guess trials or in whatever there's an indictment and this is gonna be a long process for him and basically because he never thought anything bad would happen to him driving what two hours away um, between his place here in Salem and, and up in, in, in uh, what is it St. Helens Capu somewhere in there um, yeah it's it that's it and if he's convicted it could be 10 years and I shake my head his kids 23 years old and he got too close to the flame because he didn't understand, and unfortunately, I hadn't preached on this yet at the house, um, that sometimes being risk averse, saying as far away from the fire as you possibly can, is what keeps you safe. And if you're a vulnerable person, if you have something to risk, you probably shouldn't. Well, the same is true with sin, you know, honestly. The same is true with sin, that y- we all think that you know, we can get as close to it as possible. We have the discipline to not fall over the top. And we don't. We just don't have the discipline to do that. Come on. Uh, who has the discipline to do that? Uh, it's like an alcoholic who hasn't had a drink in five or ten years who goes to a bar. Well, maybe they can handle it. Maybe they can't, right? Uh, so why would you chance it? Why would you, why would you risk it? You don't. But some people do. And had another situation with another guy that that kind of happened. Uh, um, he got around the wrong group of people and did something he shouldn't have, and uh, he got thrown in the can for a while. And and so he's out, thank goodness. And, and he's learned his lesson. Uh, it was like, I got to get away from those people. Those people are causing me trouble. Well, the you know, scripture says, bad company corrupts good character. Now that one I had preached on, so there's no excuse on that one because he had heard that sermon. Um, but again, it's not going to happen to me. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a guy that I can, I can handle it. And, and I'm, I want to talk to you tonight about no, no, we can't handle it. We can't handle it. Paul couldn't handle it. Paul says, I pleaded with the Lord three times to remove a thorn from my side, which was a messenger from Satan. Now, come on. Okay. Well, think about that. I've heard all these sermons say, well, but you know, Paul had an illness. You don't plead to God over an illness. 
right? You don't plead over and over to God, take my illness away from me. You know, you may pray about cancer or whatever, but no, he didn't have that. That's not, that's not what the scripture says. It said he pleaded with the Lord. And the Lord responded, my grace is sufficient. My strength is perfected in your weakness. Okay. What is his weakness? Well, our, all of our weaknesses, all of our weaknesses is we're sinners. All of our weaknesses is we are tempted. All of our weaknesses is we fall to temptation. And what the Lord's message back to Paul was, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. You are weak. So you can't rely on yourself. If you rely on yourself, you're going to fall and you're going to reap what you sow. But if you rely on me, my strength will be the one that goes through you through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then it says later in Scripture that no sin is, no temptations overcome you. That is unusual to man. And you have the ability to, uh, uh, you know, run away basically from all temptation. You have the authority to rebuke Satan. and But you can't do that in your own power for two reasons. One, you're not strong enough. Two, you don't want to. Let me say that again. One, you're not strong enough, right? We, we all fall to temptation. All of us. But two, we don't want to. There, there are some things out there that we want to get as close to or even fall into, right? And, and so that's why we have to rely so much on the power of the Holy Spirit in those moments. And how it starts is this. First, you got to recognize that what God calls sin is sin. You, you can't have it any other way. I was talking to another fella. Um, you can tell how my week went. I was talking to another fella um, over breakfast. And he's in a new church. He's a young, young guy. And uh, sounds like a pretty, pretty solid Bible church. And a guy that he's been kind of uh, been accountability partners with, I, th I, th I think they're close. I think they were closer than friends, uh, came out after a year, a couple of years and said, I'm gay. And started doing biblical gymnastics to justify the gay lifestyle he was going to live while still believing in Jesus. And my friend's response to that was, Ugh. you know, tell them some truth and saying that you can't have it both ways. That's not how it works. You can't embrace sin and still think that you're in the fold, right? And there are two pieces of scripture that you deal with. One is first Corinthians where the guy in the church was um, having relations that even the pagans thought were bad. I, I love that part because even the pagans thought it was bad. And scripture, Paul tells the, the leaders at Corinth, hey, kick them out of the church if they won't listen to you, if you won't repent, if you won't stop, kick them out of the church, give them to Satan until he comes to his senses and then bring them back in. And, they're, and it's very instructive. It says, you know, you go to him, you try, you, you talk to him, you tell him the error of his ways, you, you, you embrace him in the church. But if he rejects all that, well, then you let him have his way until he gets it. And then, and then you forgive him. You bring him back in, right? Yeah, you, don't, you don't ostracize the guy. That's the first scripture. Second scripture has to do with um, the, the, the fact that that even the demons know the name of Jesus and shudder. So just knowing who Jesus is or uh, any of that has no bearing on your faith, has no bearing on your, on your salvation, has no bearing on any of that. So this friend of mine was telling me this, and he says, you know, I've kind of decided that the world's so evil that the only friends I'm going to have are going to be in the church, and this guy uh, who I was close to, uh, I'm not going to have anything to do with him. Because it will sully my witness. It will, it will stain my witness for Christ. And I was like, you know, that's a pendulum swinging too far the other way in my mind. I have friends in the church that are doing the wrong things. Okay? They've embraced some sins. And my reading of the stories in Scripture, whether it's the prodigal son or whatever it might be, is you tell them truth. And I am, I am blunt. If you know anything about me, I, I say what's on my mind and I yeah, you know, just lay it out there. I'm certainly not everyone's cup of tea, believe me. But this person, I'm thinking about one situation. My wife and I, my wife's even more blunt than I am, and and which is kind of fun to watch, to be honest with you. Sometimes I just let her go, uh, so I don't have to get into it. But man, have we been blunt? <laughs> I mean, just bang. And this and this person is a very very nice person, uh, but they've made a decision that they're justifying what they're doing, even though they've always been faithful in the Lord. Now, I'm not saying they don't love the Lord. I'm saying that they're choosing themselves over, over Jesus. They're, they're saying that I'm going to choose this, this sin life, this, this thing, this rebellion against God, and I'm going to justify it somehow in my mind and uh, still say that I'm in the faith. Well, you know, okay, you could try, but that's not how God sees it. 
You know, God says over and over again, that's not how it works. Reminds me of that, that commercial about the old women. That's not how it works. Not that how any of this works. Um, you don't worship Jesus if you're not doing what he says. You're worshiping yourself, right? Jesus even said it. He says, why do you call me Lord when you don't do what I tell you? Why would you do that? If you're not going to do what I say, why would you call me Lord? And so I keep running these situations with people uh, where I don't know if it's the temptation or um, the loneliness people have or, you know, there, I mean, there's a lot of causation uh, that makes them make decisions that bring them really close to the fire. And that fire is going to consume you, right? Uh and so I want to talk a little bit about, about what you do about that tonight. And, and, and because I think we all fall to it. All of us have, let's be honest, all of us have a secret sin or all of us have a, a, a thing that is a thorn in our side like Paul. All of, us, all of us struggle. And I'll tell you another story because it's story night. Um, there was a fellow that used to come to one of my Bible studies and, and he, I didn't know him. He wasn't in our church. Somehow I found out about this Bible study I was doing, and and he caught me one time afterwards and, and said, you know, I've got a I got a problem. I said, what's that? He goes, well, I'm I, I'm gay. I said, okay, but he seemed like like a, a guy that knew his Bible and been to church and stuff. And he tells me he says, I hate it, I hate it, hate it, hate it, and I do everything I can to fight it, and I do really well, but every once in a while I fall, and, and I pray and I repent and I hate myself and blah blah blah. And I get back on the horse, dust myself off, and, and I do well for a while, and then I fall. And so my advice was, well, um, when you're falling, what are the temptations? What kind of people are you putting yourself around? How are you not having discipline not to go to those places that you know, cause you to sin, blah, blah, blah. But I love that guy. And, and here's why I love the guy. He recognized sin. He didn't call it normal. He didn't try to justify it. He recognized what it was. He struggled with it. He hated it. He fought against it. And there were times he couldn't win the battle. That's okay. You know, God sees that and goes, hey, you're fighting a good fight. Good job. Because he wasn't embracing the lifestyle. He wasn't embracing sin. He wasn't in open rebellion against God of this stuff. He, he understood it. Okay? And, and so people ask me, what's the difference between a Christian and a, a, an atheist when it comes to those things? Well, uh, a Christian sin. Atheist sin. Difference is we hate our sin. We, we would do anything if God would take our free will away so we didn't do it, right? That, that's how much we hate our sin. Atheists don't care. They don't call it sin. They don't think there is sin. I got a, I got a guy. He's funny. He's, he's, actual, he's actual pagan, if you can believe that. Um, he told me he doesn't, he doesn't believe in sin. And I said, well, that's convenient for you because if there's no sin, there's no accountability. And, and so it reminded me of my dad. My dad was a guy who didn't believe there's anything bigger than him. He was an atheist. Well, it's really convenient to believe there's no one bigger than you. Then you're not accountable to anybody or anything. There is no moral standard. You can do anything you want, right? And so uh, I, I think it's intellectually dishonest to say that because all you're trying to do is give yourself an out. And so I believe that there's a, a higher moral authority. And if you're in the faith, you, you absolutely have to believe that. And so you call right, right, and wrong, wrong, and you don't mix the two. Uh, scripture talks about how it's almost an abomination in God's eyes when you say good is evil and evil is good. And, and honestly, the only unpardonable sin that we talk about is when you ascribe evil to God, you know, the Holy Spirit. Um, that, you know, he takes that seriously. And so the first thing is really, you know, having, having your come to Jesus meeting and saying sin is sin. Okay. Uh, it, it rebelling against God's rebellion against God. So then you got to take an inventory. That, that's the second part. You got to take an inventory and say, what am I doing and where am I at where I am sinning? Now, everyone wants to point to the big ones. You remember when, when Jesus was, was uh, asking the rich young ruler, um, had he, had he, was he a sinner kind of thing? Well, you know, how do you be? He goes, I have made all the commandments since my youth, blah, blah, blah. I've never done this. I've never done that, blah, blah, blah. He only picked the big ones. He, he, he picked the big ones. Yeah, I haven't committed adultery. I haven't killed anybody. <laughs> I honored my mother and father. Woo I'm a good guy. And Jesus hit him right between the eyes and said, oh, that's fantastic. Good for you. Then go ahead and sell everything you own and give it to the poor and then come follow me. And the guy walked away because the scripture says he had a lot of stuff. Well, he had an idol. Well, idolatry, you shall have no gods before me, is like 
<laughs> the biggie, right? And and he he thought he was he thought he was righteous because he obeyed these major commands and didn't even see that he had an idol. And he had gotten so close to the fire that he couldn't even see the materialism in his life was more important than God. Right? That, 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 whoa. So, so we're not just talking about when I say make an inventory of your sin life. I'm not just talking about, are, you know, are you, are you doing the major biggie things, committing adultery or, or any of that kind of stuff. And maybe you are. So we got to talk about that. Um, boy, I got a story about that one too. A friend of mine um, uh, committed to a marriage for 20 years uh, out of the blue, left his wife and kid and, and uh, is with another woman from, from his old college days and and is unrepentant unapologetic about it and it's stunning this guy's been in church and all and you just go wow wow so some some of you may have the big things in your life where you're in complete rebellion against god because of your selfishness but i would bet that where you're closest to the flame here is in the little stuff kind of like my buddy that had the the accident that killed the guy okay you're going to drive up to St. Helens, Capoo, somewhere in Columbia County and, and just have a, a, a nice, relaxing weekend or whatever it was, day, week, whatever, at a park. What could possibly go wrong? Okay. So you are somebody in the Christian faith who is an ally. That's the language, I think, now of the LGBTQ, whatever it is. Um, you're an ally. And what that means is that you believe that lifestyle is permissible and that the scripture is wrong about it and that you don't think it's sin. Uh, love is love, all that kind of stuff. So what's wrong with that? Well, in this culture, nothing's wrong with that, honestly. Um, in, according to God, there's a lot wrong with that. We are, we are told to tell the truth in love, and that's untruthful. And not being truthful is a problem. Right? You got to be truthful. I have friends that that are, are in the LGBTQ community, uh, and if they're not in the faith, then I don't have to really worry about it too much. I tell them about the faith. I tell them about these things. They know I'm a pastor, right? We're still friends. I, I love these people. I think God loves these people, right? Uh, I don't think He loves what they do, and I would tell them God has something better for them, you know. But I'm not an ally. I'm, I'm not going to uh, normalize sin just not going to normalize it because that's not what I can do as a Christian. But some of the folks in the churches, they normalize sin. What other sins do they normalize? Everyone talks about divorce. It's really funny. People are like, well, you just say that about divorce. You, say, you won't say that divorce is a sin and you'll say, well, divorce isn't a sin. Moses allowed divorce because as Jesus said, the people's hearts were hard. God didn't say you can murder because the people's hearts are hard. He didn't say you can commit idolatry because the people's hearts are hard. God doesn't allow sin because your hearts are hard. He allowed divorce, and there were very specific circumstances for it, and Jesus reiterated that, right? And so what was the sin, though, and this is, this is, how, this is how this beauty thing worked. He said, you, you divorce because your hearts are hard. We allowed that. But if you're with somebody else, and the divorce was not for uh, infidelity, and you're with somebody else who's divorced, but their husband or wife is still alive, you're committing adultery, and adultery is a sin. So, if you're divorced, from Jesus' perspective, well, you left the wife or husband of your youth, and that's it. You're only supposed to have one. You're not supposed to have two, seven, nine, right? And and then, you know, the Pharisees were hilarious. They were trying to trap them. And they said, well, this, this woman has, has a, 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 a husband and he dies and he marries the brother. And this happened seven times. So it wasn't like infidelity. It was these brothers keep dying. Whose wife is she when she gets to heaven in the resurrection? He just goes, you don't get it. There is no marriage in the, in the resurrection. There is no marriage in heaven. You don't, you don't understand this stuff. So Jesus was trying to talk some truth here about it was from the beginning. It was one man, one woman. You're supposed to be together all your life. And if you're not going to be together because, uh, you know, whatever, you, you have irreconcilable differences uh, or you're an idiot and you leave your spouse, um, well, that's it. If you're in the faith, that's it. All right. Now, should you remarry? You know, God is good. He's gracious and he's kind. You need to repent. You need to ask forgiveness for your sin. But see, what happens is we don't think that's a sin anymore because our culture has said that's not a sin. They say divorce is a sin. It's not. God hates it because it hurts everyone. No one wins in divorce. 
but the adultery afterwards is. The adultery afterwards is. And I see Christian couples get divorced all the time. You know, matter of fact, that the statistics would probably bear out that Christians get divorced as much as anybody else. Um, but they're not repenting. And most of the time that they're getting divorced is not because of infidelity or what I would consider spousal abuse. I think, I think spousal abuse is a divorceable offense because you're not safe. And other pieces of scripture talk about um, you know, that kind of thing. But if you're just leaving because I'm unhappy, I'm unfulfilled, I like someone better, this didn't work out the way I thought it would, uh, we've grown apart, you know, all that other nonsense, well, you, you, you're wrong. And you're going to reap what you sow. And you're going to become an adulterer. And that is a sin. So do I want to get close to that sin? Or do I want to work on my marriage? I mean, are you really a believer? Or, or, or are you just playing church? And this is, this is the subtleness of deciding whether you're going to get close to the flames or you're going to stay far away from the flames. So let me give an example for my buddy. Uh, at some point, and I don't know when, he reconnected with this woman that he was in love with in college, okay? And he probably created what we call an emotional relationship. An emotional relationship is where um, you're, not, you're not necessarily romantic, but you're fulfilling each other's emotional needs that you're not getting at home. I understand she was recently divorced. And you just believe that that person's doing something for you, your spouse can't. Well, that's of the devil, man. <laughs> to quote the water boy, that's of the devil. Mama said that's of the devil. Um, that that gets flamed. And the next thing you know, you're like, oh, I, I, this person loves me and I love them. And I, don't, I can never meet another person like this. And I never should have left them and blah, blah, blah. And then you're making these really sinful decisions. And it ends up, you, you commit adultery. And... And so that's getting way too close to the flames. That's getting as, as close as you can to the edge, thinking it's not going to happen to me. I'll never fall off the edge. And then, bam. Next thing you know, you're at it. We got it. And I, I tell you, if you're, if you're a non-believer, I don't really care. You can do whatever you want. It was funny. I was reading the, uh, the papers this morning, I think, and they were talking about that, that attorney, Avanti, I think his name is, and the stripper, uh, uh, Stormy Daniels, who was with Trump and all this stuff. And they were saying that those two had gone to court and that Avanti is going to jail, but he also owes her a bunch of money for r ripping her off. And I'm like, couldn't happen to two nicer people, right? They're, they're unbelievers. And, and, and whatever happens to them, they, they get. I don't really care about that. I only care about if you're a believer... And you're and you've confessed Jesus is Lord. Why are you risking anything? Why would you even think you're supposed to get closer to sin? I forget which book it is, but they, they ask Paul, maybe it's Second Corinthians, uh, a little fuzzy tonight. They said, well, if God's grace is uh, abundant and expands, you know, as 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 we sin, shouldn't we sin more? So we'll get more of it. And they're like, he's like, oh no, you guys are killing me. No, of course not. You know, you're supposed to be transformed. Once you have the Holy Spirit in you, once you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you should have uh, this this renewal, this re redemption in you, 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 you know, regeneration where you become a new creation in Christ and you don't want to do that anymore. You don't want to sin anymore. Not just, not just, not just that you respect Jesus so you don't want to do it. You don't want to do it. It's not part of you anymore, right? Now, we all know that if you, if, as you walk in your walk in the faith, you get, you get stronger and stronger, especially as you get older and older and get wiser and wiser and all that kind of stuff. You don't get as close to it. But you always have something because our fallen nature is just that. It can be you're just not loving, right? So I go back to my buddy who says he's not going to be friends with that, the guy in church that's doing the, the biblical gymnastics to try to say that being gay is okay. Um, at least in the Lord's eyes. Okay, I get it. I, I get you don't want to hang out with him and be an accountability partner and all that kind of stuff. But you don't stop loving the guy. You don't. You, I mean, what what kind of walk do you show if you just abandon people who um, are struggling? Right. Now I get the church saying in First Corinthians, kick him out because this guy was unrepentant completely and he didn't care. Well, he wasn't a believer anymore. I mean, this guy just, and the question was, was he a believer in the first place? The fella here in this situation um, claims he's a believer, claims claims he loves Jesus, and and he's blinded by Satan. 
And so, yeah, I'm, I'm going to tell them some, if it's me, I'm going to tell them some truth. I'm going to kick him in the butt. I'm going to, um, you know, be engaged with him because I don't want him lost to the fires. I, I'm going to stay on him. Now, I'm not going to hang out with him and do stuff with him and all that kind of stuff, but I'm not going to abandon him. There's, there's, a, there's a balance there. I'm not going to become a monk and just sequester myself with my, you know, elders in the church. That's not what we're called to do. We're called to get our hands dirty. We're called to, you know, roll up our sleeves and, and get in there. Um, you know, in, in uh, I think it's uh, 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 12. You, uh, the, uh, Paul's writing, I've talked about this before, and he tells us, hold everybody accountable to the church. You judge those in the church. You judge them by the standard of Christ, and you hold each other accountable. That's what you do. That's why it says in Scripture, let's share our sins together, right, so we can help each other. The most uncomfortable thing in the world, no one wants to do that because we don't want to admit we have sin. And again, it's not the big stuff that we get close to. It's the little stuff we get close to. And I, I am as guilty as anyone out there. I'll tell you, I'll tell you my, one of my vices that I have struggled with, the movies I watch, the media I put in my head, right? Um, yeah, there's a, there's a study that my wife showed me that said, if you came from a background like mine, child abuse and all these different things, uh, you, you tend to watch violent movies and be comforted in a sense because of it. It's a weird psychological thing, but it's true. I can watch those movies and they don't phase me. It's not real. I never never consider them to be any part of reality it's just mindless entertainment and should i watch them no that's it's lousy you know um do the movies do i watch r-rated movies yeah i've watched r-rated movies there's crap in them and i shouldn't be doing that uh lately i just watch a lot of karate movies uh but yeah i i, I you ought to see my movie collection i remember when pastor greg sneller came over to my house one time and he was the pastor at calvary baptist when i first started back at church he comes over to my house and he looks at my movies and goes oh sinner it was really funny um but it's true i got 1100 movies and most of them you wouldn't want in your house uh so that yeah i'm bad i'm bad uh i have the issue like you do and it's subtle because most people say well it's no big deal you have those movies but it kind of is right um garbage in garbage out Right? Can, uh, how a man thinks is how he is. So there's that. There's there's sins of um, Scripture says, "Don't drink unto drunkenness." Okay. Well, what does that mean? Should you recreationally drink? No, you shouldn't. There's no reason for it, because you're you're no matter how well you handle your liquor, um, you're going to do dumb stuff. Just is what it is. Uh, but it also means marijuana. I know people that say, well, I can't sleep without having, having you know, a bong or whatever it is. <laughs> I, need to, I need to smoke marijuana or take a, take a gummy. I can't even take one. No, you don't. No, you don't. You do, you're just using. And they don't see it as that because there's justification. So we made our list of our sins, right? This is what we're trying. I want to go back to the list. So you, you admit you got the problem. You make your little list of, of the things you're doing. And it's a lot of the subtle stuff. And then third, you figure out where you're making your justifications. Which ones are you close to that you keep doing over and over and over and over again because you've justified is okay? And which ones are you trying fighting? And you make two columns and just put down your list. So on my movie one, for example, I don't fight that very much, and I probably should. I've you know, talked about that for years, and i kind of got to get to it. Um, other ones I fight like crazy. And uh, I don't always win, but I, I'm like that, that gay guy that was in my... In my uh, uh, Bible study. He fight, 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 and he'd fall down. He fight, 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 and fall down. That's kind of me on some of them, right? Uh, where are you at? How close to the fire are you getting on some of them? And you're not fighting it, right? Um, road rage. You know, guy cuts you off. Got your got the fish on the back of your car, and you're showing him the middle finger. <laughs> what's, what's your witness like? <laughs> I'm not saying we don't get frustrated. I get frustrated, believe me. Especially when my PTT, PTSD rages. I'm, I'm a maniac. Uh, uh, so nothing I'm saying here is just about you. It's, it's, I'm talking about me too. Uh, I'm talking about all of us. But you can be somebody who is not following the way of the Lord. Now, Scripture talks about having love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. That's the litmus test. That's the litmus test. Are you being that person? That's the person God wants you to be. So um, in your language, are you loving? I mean, that's a simple little sin. But Scripture says the tongue has the power to give life or death. Are you giving life or are you giving death? 
with the things you say. Are you gossiping? You know, people don't even talk about gossip anymore, right? Are you gossiping? Are you giving life or death? Are you an encourager or not, right? That's a simple one. So, Tom, that's not a sin. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Disparaging somebody else. If you read, um, I think it's the, the piece right before the spiritual fruit in Galatians 5, 19 through 21, talks about dis, um, uh, dissensions. He says, that, you know, the, the evil fruit is dissensions. Are you causing dissensions? If so, you're sinning. I mean, see how subtle it is? And it's not, it's not to say that, well, it is to say. It is to say we're bad people. Uh, yeah, I was going to say it's not to say we're bad people. But we are bad people. And, and this is one of the things you got to realize. All of us short, fall short of the glory of God. There's not one righteous, not one. Because if there were, we wouldn't need Jesus. If, if everything worked the way it was supposed to work, we wouldn't need Jesus. And we do need Jesus. And that's why Jesus was talking about, even if you looked at a woman lustfully, you've sinned. And that was a, a complete flip for the Pharisees. They were like, well, I've never touched a woman, blah, 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 so I'm clean. No, you're not. You thought about it, and, and you've already fantasized about it, and so you've done it. And Jesus raised the bar and said, you don't get it. Everyone needs a Savior because everyone's fallen short because everyone has done something either physically or mentally to break every commandment there is to break. Right? Now, one thing in the Bible, I don't think that I've not done up here or physically. And that's how badly I need a Savior because I'm a wretched individual. Like Paul said, because of all the sinners, I'm the worst. I'm a wretched individual. I'm a wretched man. I feel the exact same way. Now, there by the grace of God I go. So I don't have like a self, self-esteem self issue because I understand that what I needed was Jesus. And Jesus then redeemed me. And, and I'm okay. I'm okay in God's sight, right? He sees me as holy and righteous, and that's okay. But my responsibility in return in this relationship is I have to recognize what sin is. What does rebellion against God look like? Not according to what I think it looks like or what I think is right or wrong, but what according to God does rebellion against him look like? And what is my response to that supposed to be? My response is I should stay as far away from it as possible so that I don't get tempted and fall into, into the trap, right? And honestly, we, we get into things. We get into things. I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, my wife and I have been looking at getting a class B kind of vanny kind of thing because I have trouble traveling because of my health issues. And if I had one of those, I could travel a lot easier. And so we found one, and we're doing this online thing, and it's it's fishy. Some something's not right about this thing. Just I won't go into the details, but it's not right. And being taken advantage of with from a guy that has my background as a kid, oh man, does that just trigger me? Oh my goodness, fires me up, fires me up. And I'm telling my wife, I said, we just need to stop this thing because you know it's, it's not worth going forward. And, and the Lord, good, good Lord, yeah, good Lord is keeping me calm, right? And uh, my wife's like, oh, we, we should see this through and catch this guy. And I'm like, you do not want me to catch this guy because I know me and that puts me too close to the flame. And in my anger, I will sin. And scripture says, don't sin in your anger. Okay. Scripture says that. So I know because what scripture says, I'm not supposed to sin in my anger. Well, I know that I get angry because of my PTSD and some of the issues I have, right? And so I've got to stay as far away from being that kind of angry because there's nothing righteous about it so that I don't sin in my anger. That's what being a Christian's like. You, 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 you got to recognize where you have temptation issues where you will fall but you got to know the scriptures well enough to know what the what the sins are you got to know what god says is rebellion against him and then you got to take this inventory and assessment and say am i rebelling against god and you know what the answer is yes yes you are there's somewhere in your life you're rebelling against god because you want to get as close as possible you don't think it's going to happen to you you don't think you're going to have consequences for it you're not going to reap what you sow none of what none of the what guys like me preach at you uh is applies to you it applies to everyone else you know, George, you better listen to this. <laughs> you ever been to church and done that? You're listening and go, man, that, that really applies to Mark. <laughs> Stop talking about you. All the things we preach about, all of us that are in the pulpit and banging on this stuff, it's trying to get you in your walk to be the one who finds, who finds, because they're looking, the narrow gate. Wide is the road that leads to destruction, and many, many find it. Narrow is the gate that leads to eternal life, 
and few find it. Well, you got to be looking, one. And two, the path, the path is a Roman's road. You got to pick up your cross. You got to die to yourself. What does that mean? Well, I think certain things are okay. I got to die to that because God says they aren't okay. Okay? So, um, I get frustrated with customer service issues. And not okay for me to share my feelings with those poor people on the phone that aren't really competent. I can't tell them you're incompetent. You drive me crazy, right? You can't do that. It's mean. It's 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 not it's not loving. I'm not, I, as a Christian, I can't do that. That's not what I do. Now I might think it, and I have to repent. Sorry, God, I'm thinking these thoughts again, right? Because I am sinning in my head, but I'm not acting out on it because I got to control myself in those areas. And I and that's for me, that's a sin area for me. That's one of those ones where I get close to the fire sometimes. Now this gets to the second point sometimes you can't avoid it. i was with in this meeting today and the person says well what if you can't control this environment or that environment so that's a really good point there are things we can control and we make the mistake because we make a decision to get too close to the flames right and we can trigger ourselves or we can do things where there's serious consequences and way too much risk involved um, but there are times where we can't control the environment things are happening to us and this is my answer to that when you die you're going to see jesus and he's not going to ask you about the other guy. Okay, so you're driving down the road. Some guy cuts you off. And you're like, <laughs> God's, when you meet Jesus, he's going to say, remember that time you got cut off? You go, yeah, yeah, I do. And he's going to say, why did you act like that? And if you even try to say, well, the other guy, he's like, I don't, I don't, I don't, don't worry about the other guy. Why, why did you do what you did? Right. I, I got a, a note from a guy tonight um, who is having uh, some, uh, it's a domestic issue kind of thing. And he was uh, wondering why the person was mad at the, why would be that mad at him. And, and it has to do with some of his actions. And I said, well, that has to do with your actions. And his response was, well, she did the same to me, so, you know, she shouldn't be mad about that. I'm like, when you meet Jesus, <laughs> he's going to ask you about your actions. And if you say, well, she, he's going, well, stop, stop, stop. I'm not talking about her. I'm talking about you. And how I know this is true. And when Jesus was, was resurrected, he was walking with Peter. And he's telling Peter, Peter, hey, this is what's going to happen to you. You're going to you're going to uh, go out there and you're going to actually leave the church. It'd be great. And you're going to end up dying for me. And Peter's not kind of listening like Peter, you know, Peter. And he looks over his shoulder and sees John. He goes, well, what about him? And you can just see Jesus go, oh, gosh, you got to be kidding me. And he looks at Peter and says, don't worry about him. You worry about you. And that's the reality here. In an environment you can't control, it's not about the other people. It's still about you and how you respond and what you do and how you present yourself as a Christian. And that includes as far as martyrdom. You know, you look at all the martyrs and how they how they willingly went to the to the, to the fires or uh, you know whatever they did because they weren't going to deny, deny his name. They, they, their witness was always about when I meet Jesus, I have to account for myself. Those people, God will hold them accountable. You know, his justice is perfect. Whatever they've done wrong, they'll be held accountable for. That's not my problem. My problem is how I respond in whatever circumstances because Jesus is going to ask me about me. And that's a tough one. Because we love to blame other people for our actions. You know, even in our language, we'll say, you know, so-and-so made me so mad. No, they didn't. They may have triggered something that, that caused anger in you, but you're in control of your emotions. Or maybe not, right? I know for me, like, I have uh, PTSD and I get this trigger thing, right? So something will happen to trigger something and it's like, well, you know, I'm learning to control and do all these things, take my meds, all this stuff. Um, but that's me. I'm responsible for that. And so I, I have a responsibility to work on it and do things to get better at it, right? Now, you want the other person to be respectful and not trigger and all those things. So you talk to them, right? So I talk to my wife about, hey, don't do this or don't do that. I would appreciate it if I had blah, blah, blah. But it doesn't always happen. That's life. And, and bing, wow, boom. Well, I'm responsible. So when I meet Jesus, he's going to say, remember that time when you know Lisa was doing X and and you guys were having a conversation and you got really agitated and said some unkind things? I'm going to go, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to say, yeah, but she she didn't do what I... No, because it's about how I acted. 
And so there's that part of your sin life where you don't get to blame the other people. You don't get to blame your responses, your actions, your free will on anybody else. You know, the old comment that the devil made me do it, it's not true. In scripture it says that most of the sins we commit are from our own evil desires. It's not because Satan's doing anything to you or tempting you. Satan's not behind every tree going, ah, now's the time to get him. That's not happening. Um, what's happening is you all have your own evil desires in you because of our fallen nature. And we are to die to those. We're to die to ourselves. Crucify them with Jesus. Pick up our cross daily, right? And it is a daily thing, which is why it says God's mercies are new every single day. Every day we fall. Every day we screw up. And I hope what you're doing is every night when you go to bed, you uh, praise God as the first thing you do, and then you confess your sins to him. You think through the things you did, the things you were supposed to do that you didn't do, and then you ask God, show me, you know, reveal to me the things I don't even know I did. And you ask forgiveness, you ask for strength so that the Holy Spirit can keep you from those things. You ask that you'll listen to the Holy Spirit instead of ignore him when he tells you not to do something, right? And you make amends where you have to. If you've harmed somebody else, you ask for forgiveness, right? If someone has harmed you, you give them forgiveness. You do all the things that Scripture says. You know, this isn't rocket science. The book is pretty easy to read uh, when it comes to here's what the faith stands for, right? And this is, and if you, if you need to, get online and just Google it because you, you can find a commentary anywhere that tells you what all this stuff means. But what you can't do is say... I'm going to get as close to this rebellion to God as possible because I like the heat of the fire and it won't happen to me. I won't fall. I won't be one of those guys. Scripture tells us that in these days, these last days, and these last days have been going on for a long time, um, but these last days, and I would say the last days in my mind are the, the, the giving of the Holy Spirit. So for the past 2,000 years, the giving of the Holy Spirit, which is, is restraining sin, if you can believe that, um, in these last days, men will want to hear what their itching ears want. They won't listen to sound doctrine. Many, if it's possible, Scripture says, that are, are in the faith will leave the faith. And you see this all the time, people leaving the faith. Uh, and, and there's going to be a, a remnant of us, just like of Israel. There will be a remnant of us that stand firm to the end. And it's not going to be pretty for us. I, I liked, uh, I think it was C.S. Lewis that said, if everyone's running toward the cliff and you're running away from it, you look like you're the crazy one. And that's, that's true. We look like we're crazy if we stand firm. Now, we have to live a life, according to Scripture, that is so winsome. I'll use that word, which means it's, it, it's so uh, enviable that others on the outside look at us and go, man, they, they seem pretty darn content. And they're not doing anything wrong. They're good citizens. They're nice people. Um, they're crazy believing in that God thing. But beyond that, you know, they're okay. They should see that. So even when I have friends that are not in the faith who are involved in all sorts of crazy sin stuff, I love. I show them the love of Christ. Right? You don't win people to Christ by beating them over the head with the Bible. You got to show them who Jesus is. You got to show them that He loves them, cares about them, but has something better for them. For those in the church, um, you know, those that want to stick to the faith, we disciple and we work together. Those that want to try to stray, we tell them, "Hey, look, here's here here are the guardrails, and and we're going to tell you some truth. We do it in love, but we're gonna, we're going to give you some truth, and and we're going to do what Scripture says and hold you accountable to it. Now, if you don't want to be part of the gang, just say you don't be part of the gang." Uh, I have no problem with someone who says, you know what, this whole Christianity thing, um, I, I've never really kind of bought into it in the first place, and, and it was a great community, but I, I want to go off and do all these things that the Bible says I can't do, so I'm going to go do it. How about it? I mean, Jesus never chased anybody who said that. But if you're going to be a guy that says, okay, I, I'm all in. I, I'm going to be a Christian, okay? I am going to have Jesus be my Lord and Savior then you sure as heck better know what sin looks like and stay as far away from it as possible. Do not create a life for yourself that is putting yourself at risk because there's a lot to risk. Matthew 7, 21. On that day, many will call me Lord, Lord, and I'll say, I never knew you. 
Jesus is going to look at you if you're one of those people that thinks you can have a foot here and a foot here. He's going to say, I don't know you. You're not one of mine. We don't have a relationship. Why do you say, why do you say, Lord, Lord, if you're not doing what I say? Right? Those who love me will obey my commands. That's what he says. And what are his commands? His commands are the same as the entire Bible. Do right. Love justice. Love mercy. Don't sin. Be humble. Turn the other cheek. All those, all the things he said. And so life is hard. You know, honestly, this life right now, um, it, it's miserable out there compared to at least how I grew up. And and when when more and more people were believers than are now, and the and the Christian faith was kind of the dominant culture, it's not anymore. It's hard. Uh, but you know what I've noticed? I've never been treated any differently as a Christian by really anybody out there, whether it was when the culture was dominant and now that it's not, because I've always been a guy that wants to use my tongue for encouraging. I've always been a guy that wants to show the Christian faith as a very um, great, comfortable, loving, godly thing. Now, I may say I disagree with you about some of the cultural things. You know, I may say, well, you know, we, we don't embrace that as a as a normality you know it's transgender you know call, call it what it is i don't care excessive gambling excessive drinking what well, you you don't pick your poison we don't think adultery is right we don't we'll, we'll draw a line on those things and we'll tell you this is what the bible says if you really want to read the bible we'll tell you what it says no divorce is not a sin because moses allowed it adultery afterwards is right and so um, and we'll talk about the hypocrisy in the church. We'll talk about the sinful nature of, of mankind and that we are just as bad and we have to fight it, right? We'll talk about all that stuff. But we'll do so in such a way that really represents the Jesus that, that I know. But how can I do that if I'm not fighting my sin? And this is where I do agree with my buddy in terms of the witness piece. If, if his friend is not fighting his sin, he says, I'm a Christian, but I'm gay and I'm living a gay lifestyle and I'm you know, doing whatever I'm doing, um, then he's not living the faith and it's a lie, right? If he's not saying that sin, then he's a liar. And First John talks about you know, those who say without sin are, are liars and, and he's kind of lying and that's a bad thing. So I get why my friend would say, I don't want my witness to be sullied by somebody who's saying they're a Christian who's really showing a bad, a bad thing. I agree with that. And, and so what I would tell this friend is, you're not being a Christian. And just stop calling yourself Christian. Just because you believe Jesus is Lord, you know, the Messiah, the, 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 the anointed one. Satan believes Jesus is the anointed one. You're not telling me anything that the, the devils don't already tell you. Do you have a relationship with him? Is he your Lord and Savior? That's the question. And if he's your Lord and Savior, why are you disobeying him? That's the question. So I can, I can be a friend to this person. And I would just be honest and say to anybody who wants to see this walk, why are you, why are you even having lunch with that guy? Well, I'm trying to explain to him that he's off the reservation. And he's a Matthew 7, 21 guy. God, Lord, God, Jesus is going to say, I don't know you. And I don't want that to happen to him. Because the Lord says, I want none to perish. We are supposed to go out and share the good news of the gospel with everybody. And that includes those in the church that fall away. We don't just let them fall away. At least I don't. I mean, I, I, I've seen it. I had a, 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 a friends that, that join other churches, do other crazy things. And it's like, you're honest with him. He's like, oh, God, you're driving me crazy. And I don't stop being friends with him. I, I want them to know the good news. I want them to see Christ the way I see Christ. You know, if, if Jesus was willing to take a chance on me with my background and he saw me as redeemable, I, I didn't see me as redeemable, but he saw me as redeemable, then can't I do the same for someone else? But that intrudes truth. So uh, when I preach, I tell people, don't get close to sin. I tell people, don't put yourself in a position where you'll be triggered and that triggering will cause you to sin, anger or whatever else. Don't put yourself in positions where you're close to the flame. I also tell them, when you're in an environment where you can't control the environment, the thing you can't control is yourself. And 
whether that is like for me sometimes if I get fired up and I'm triggered up I gotta leave and then I don't sin because I wasn't in that environment where I where I stayed so I take the action to do the right thing but I controlled the one thing I could control was me other times um, I just do my thing and be self depreciating right and and be that Christian guy it's funny with my family um, I'm kind of a nut to them they, they knew me back when I was a wild partier and all that kind of stuff and I'm sure when I came to the faith um, you know I'm now the God guy in the family and they don't really know what to what to think about that so I go to family events and you know our family's a little weird anyway but um, yeah it's 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 weird <laughs> it's different than what it was when I was younger with all the kids and all that kind of stuff and that's okay I just want them to know Jesus and they and and you know I don't think any of them even talk to me about Jesus when I'm there because they know if they get me started it's coming uh, but I love all those guys so much but I'm the God guy and I am gonna be the weirdo and I'm gonna be the guy running away from the cliff uh, the best I can so let's do this let's let's agree to this as we as we end up our hour um, let's all agree that what scripture says is true what God says is sin is sin you know the creator of the universe gets to decide his rules okay I, 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 I can't put it any other way than that and it doesn't matter whether you like it or not okay God's ways are in our ways and and if you're gonna follow either follow or don't but let's just let's just be black and white about it okay and if you're gonna follow then you're gonna do an inventory and say where am I in my life in my sin life what what's going on where am I struggling what ones are not a really a problem but they pop up which ones am I getting too close to the flames on which ones am I out of control with then I'm gonna make a column and say okay which one of these you know are they subtle are they are they are they big which one of these are ones where I've got the wrong attitude about it right am I getting too close to the fire is it influencing me is it causing my witness to suffer am I am I am I going to risk too much because I'm doing these things or am I in a position where I hate that sin and I'm fighting against that sin and I'm trying to do everything I can to fight against you know to, to overcome that sin right where am I at now that's, and, and this is one of those things where you're just gonna be honest about it uh, don't don't hide you're not hiding from God or anything and then I want you to think about reaping and sowing scripture says clearly you reap what you sow if you reap good stuff you get good stuff you reap bad stuff you reap bad stuff if you're sinning rebelling against God you're gonna reap bad stuff it's either gonna be in this life or the next and so where are you gonna reap right now what are you sowing and what are you going to reap for it? And be honest. What what are you going to reap for the things that you're doing? Are you taking risks where what you're going to reap is not worth not worth the risk? Okay? So you know that. And then the last part is what's your action plan? What are you going to do about it? Yeah, it's all good it's all good to talk about this stuff. We all talk about this stuff. What are you going to do about it? You know, in my life, uh, there's been a lot of things I've had to change in terms of my attitude, in terms of my thinking, in terms of my actions, to get away from the fire. Uh, there are things that I very much am attracted to that are rebellion against God that I've got to stay really far away from because they're just too attractive. And so, and when I don't stay away from those things, it's a magnet pulls me right in. So what's the action plan? How do you stay away from these things? Is it an accountability partner? I've got one of those. Is it groups? I've, I've been in those. Um, uh, do you share your sins with somebody? Accountability partner, someone else? I've done that. Uh, it, it, you do. You put these things in place. So that, so that when you meet Jesus, and you're going to, and he asks you about these things, you can say, I fought the good fight. I ran the race. I didn't always succeed, but I allowed you to be my strength and my weakness. And I sought forgiveness every time I sinned, just like David, which is why he was a man after God's own heart. And I did my best to turn around my ways. And I fought my sin nature, uh, you know, crazily every day. And every day I accepted your mercies and forgiveness and your grace. And I did everything I could to share that with everyone else. That's how you get that well done, good and faithful servant. It's not that you performed badly. 
it's that you perform for the right reasons. I perform badly, trust me. But I'm always repenting. I'm always with God. I'm always talking. It's always about the relationship. And I know I'm always forgiven because of what Jesus did. So where are you? Are you, are you, are you close to the flame? Are you setting yourself up? Are you doing dumb stuff? Are you risking too much? Or are you good? And the answer is you're not good. So do that inventory. See what happens. Okay, my time's up here on this beautiful Friday night, and uh, I hope you have a great weekend. Um, we got some things planned, so it'll be fun for us as well. Uh, I am not preaching again at, at Samanka until the, the third Sunday, fourth Sunday, but I'll be back here, I think, on the second Friday, which is a week from tonight. So I'll keep you up to date on my schedule, and in the meantime, just be blessed and uh, uh, be sure to be an encourager to others. The tongue has the power of life and death, so give life to somebody.